This is Mary Diebler, and this is the story of Noah Webster, educator and lexicographer. Why would a man spend 27 years working alone on an American dictionary, painstakingly writing out definitions, originations, and pronunciations of words from A to zygomatic? Noah Webster gathered a collection of 70,000 words. Of these 70,000 words, over 12,000 of them were words that had not been detailed in any English dictionary up to that time. Words such as skunk, squash, hickory, and chowder, uniquely American words, found their way into Webster's Dictionary. Not only did new, colorful words reflect the American English language, but also new definitions. For Noah Webster witnessed the birth of a nation, a new nation founded, as Webster wrote, on the principles of a Republican government having their origin in the scriptures. An American could not relate to the word govern if it were defined using the word monarch or king. Words such as government, constitution, republic, democracy, and others all needed definitions reflecting the American Christian philosophy of government. Noah Webster felt strongly that if America was to do well as a nation, her citizens must have consistency in their language consistent spelling, pronunciation, and usage, as well as a uniqueness which would distinguish them from England. His desire was that children would be taught in the school's proper spelling, pronunciation, and grammar, and in the midst of this he also sprinkled lessons of Christian morality and patriotism. Webster wrote several textbooks, the most famous of which was the American Spelling Book, which gained the nickname the Blue-Backed Speller because of its binding. Over a period of 100 years following the initial publication, more than 100 million copies of the American Spelling Book were used by schoolchildren across the country. Prior to Webster's publication of the American Spelling Book, the popular sentiment toward spelling might have best been summed up by Benjamin Franklin, who said that he, quote, had no use for a man with but one spelling for a word, unquote. Noah Webster obviously did not agree with this, although he was interested in making spelling simpler and more phonetic. Thanks to Webster, then, we have honor, H-O-N-O-R, instead of H-O-N-O-U-R, music, M-U-S-I-C, instead of M-U-S-I-C-K, plow, P-L-O-W, instead of P-L-O-U-G-H, and center, C-E-N-T-R-E was changed to the more common sense spelling of C-E-N-T-E-R. There are other changes in spelling Webster recommended, which we follow today. However, he rejected Benjamin Franklin's suggestion that tongue, T-O-N-G-U-E, be changed to T-U-N-G, and women, W-O-M-E-N, to W-I-M-M-E-N. In the process of compiling the American Dictionary, Noah Webster learned more than 20 different languages. Chaldaic, Syriac, Arabic, Samaritan, Hebrew, Ethiopic, Persian, Irish, both Hibernian and Celtic, Amoric, Anglo-Saxon, German, Dutch, Swedish, Danish, Greek, Latin, Italian, Spanish, French, Russian, Portuguese, Welsh, Gothic, and early dialects of English and German. Mastery of all these languages allowed him to thoroughly examine a word's origin, pronunciation, and definition. His scholarly research significantly contributed to the fields of philology and lexicography. At the age of 66, Noah Webster penned the last word of his American Dictionary in January 1825 in Cambridge, England, where he had gone to research in their vast libraries. In describing that day, he wrote, When I had come to the last word, I was seized with a trembling which made it somewhat difficult to hold my pen steady for writing. The cause seemed to have been the thought that I might not then live to finish the work, or the thought that I was so near to the end of my labors. But I summoned strength to finish the last word, and then walking about the room a few minutes, I recovered." American Dictionary was published in 1828 and has been revised many times since then, unfortunately losing much of the original wording over time. Webster's philosophy toward language, education, and scripture can perhaps be best illustrated by hearing his definition of the word love. Love, 
in a general sense, to be pleased with, to regard with affection, on account of some qualities which excite pleasing sensations or desire of gratification. We love a friend on account of some qualities which give us pleasure in his society. We love a man who has done us a favor, in which case gratitude enters into the composition of our affection. We love our parents and our children on account of their connection with us and on account of many qualities which please us. We love to retire to a cool shade in summer. We love a warm room in winter. We love to hear an eloquent advocate. The Christian loves his Bible. In short, we love whatever gives us pleasure and delight, whether animal or intellectual, and if our hearts are right, we love God above all things, as the sum of all excellence and all the attributes which can communicate happiness to intelligent beings. In other words, the Christian loves God with the love of complacency in his attributes, the love of benevolence toward the interests of his kingdom, and the love of gratitude for the favors received. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew 22. In thinking about Noah Webster's American Dictionary, it is startling to realize that every word was penned by his own hand over a course of 27 years. His dedication to Christ and the country resulted in a work that has influenced generations of students. Noah realized that it was God who made it all possible. He wrote in the preface of the 1828 American Dictionary, To that great and benevolent being, who, during the preparation of this work, has sustained a feeble constitution amidst obstacles and toils, disappointments, infirmities, and depression, who has borne me and my manuscripts in safety across the Atlantic, and given me strength and resolution to bring this work to a close, I would present the tribute of my most grateful acknowledgments. And if the talent which he entrusted to my care has not been put to the most profitable use in his service, I hope it has not been kept laid up in a napkin, and that any misapplication of it may be graciously forgiven. This is Mary Dubler, and I hope you've enjoyed the story of Noah Webster. <laughs>